imagine, if you will, that you go into work one day, you're a .NET developer, you're sat at your desk and your boss comes walking over and he's talking about the new SignalR service that you're building. And of course, you've got the connection set up, but now your boss tells you that you have to use AWS Lambda for all of your backend processing tasks. SignalR relies on you having a persistent connection. SignalR uses WebSockets. And yet Lambda spins up execution environments for every single request that comes in. And then execution environments get frozen when a request isn't being processed. So what does that mean for your Lambda-based SignalR application? How do you build a SignalR application on AWS Lambda? And that is what you're going to learn in this video today, my friends. You're going to learn how you can leverage SignalR whilst using AWS Lambda for your backend processing tasks. One, to actually generate video suggestions using Amazon Bedrock. Let's get into it. Over 70% of you watching this video today are not subscribed to this channel. And what I promise to you right now is that if you scroll down there and hit that subscribe button, I will put everything in my power to producing content that matters to you. You .NET developers, you Java developers out there, trying to build things with serverless. So if you're one of that 70%, please scroll down, hit that subscribe button, and I guarantee you that I produce content that matters. Thank you. Let's start with a quick revisit of exactly where you're at right now. You've got this application to generate video suggestions, and that uses Amazon Bedrock. If I hit DynamoDB, I want to generate some video content about DynamoDB. This is going to send a request over a SignalR backend into an SQS queue. And then there's a worker service that's processing that queue and sending the responses back to my front end. You can see them coming through there. This is using a application hosted on Fargate on Amazon ECS. Now, of course, hosting a queue worker on Fargate means that you're paying for that task that's running all of the time, even if there's no work to be done in the actual application. Now, of course, Lambda is perfect for these kinds of tasks because Lambda allows you to do work only when there is work there to be done. So what we want to have a look at now is how you can take this SignalR application that's hosted on Fargate and ECS and move the backend processing component of that to AWS Lambda. So let's jump over to your IDE now. If you've cloned this repo, link's in the description below, of course. And what you, you will see is there's now this signalr.lambda project. Previously, you had this signalr.translation worker. This is the service that was running on Fargate to do the work. And you have the video suggestions worker here that's actually pulling the messages from your SQS queue, looping over each message one by one, DC realizing the contents, getting the suggestions and sending the data back over the signal or connection. That is all work that you've got to do yourself. You've got to manage reading from the queue. You've got to manage deleting messages from the queue after you've finished. And Lambda can help reduce all of that. But actually, as you learned about in the intro, Lambda and SignalR don't intuitively fit well together because SignalR itself, of course, needs that persistent connection. So if you have a look at your SignalR.Lambda project, this is using the Lambda annotations framework to build these Lambda functions, and you open up the functions.cs file, this is where all the code is for your Lambda function. And you see you've got some pretty similar stuff to what you had in the translation work. You've got a video suggestion server, and then you've actually got the same hub context, the same SignalR hubs that were used in your traditional worker. And then you've got all the dependency injection configuration. We're setting up the services. We're adding the Bedrock Runtime Client, the Translate Client, mapping our interface to the actual implementation. And one thing you'll notice as part of this constructor is that you're actually creating a web application. You're actually starting up ASP.NET as part of this Lambda function. Albeit you're not doing that to actually create a connection to anything, but you're still starting it up. And you see you're still mapping the hubs as you would have done previously. Of course, there's nothing here to actually connect to. There's no endpoint as such. But SignalR is very closely related to ASP.NET, which means that for Lambda to work with SignalR, you need ASP.NET to be running in one way, shape or form. So to do this, and this is the most important thing to take away from this video, 
is that if somewhere at some point you will need to start up a web application. So here's you here at the start of the constructor, we're creating the web application builder, we're then building the web application and that will then get everything ready. And then when you pull the relevant service from your dependency injection container, you're pulling that from your actual app. Then when you actually get to the video suggestion worker, this is the actual Lambda function definition. Again, this is using Lambda annotations framework to simplify some of the definition of your Lambda function. And much like we did in the translation worker, if you go back to the actual code that how this used to be in the translation worker, everything inside the for each is exactly the same. Still looping over messages from SQS, you're still DC realizing the contents, you're still using the video suggestion service to suggest same as you are here, apart from now, you don't have to deal with any of that undifferentiated heavy lifting of reading from SQS and deleting from SQS. And when there's no work to be done and nothing in your queue, Lambda will be costing you nothing. One of the benefits of Lambda, of course. And then actually the actual video suggestion service itself works in exactly the same way. If you have a look at the Bedrock video suggestion service, you see that the constructor still takes in your Bedrock runtime client and of course your signal R hub, the hub context. And then when the suggestions run, whenever a chunk is received back from Bedrock, then you're going to send a message down your signal R connection. This all works partly because you're using a Redis backplane for your signal R connections. So although you can move some of this backend stuff into Lambda, Fundamentally, the actual connection point, the actual place where your front end connects to your back end, that will always need to be on Fargate because you need that persistent connection. However, what this can look like is to have some kind of thin application layer running on Fargate that's simply just managing your signal or connections. And then you can have the back end processing working in Lambda. And as long as you've got that Redis backplane, and all of your signal or services, wherever they're running, are connecting to the same Redis instance. This will just work. It's the beauty of signal R, and you've seen it before, and you'll see it again and again. This is what makes signal R so powerful. Is this way you can have multiple instances of it running, all sharing the same backplane, and therefore all sharing the same connection. If you look at the constructor of your actual function, and you see you've got this setup signal R method. And it's this setup signal R method that's going to read the Redis connection endpoint from an environment variable. And it's actually going to set up signal R using Redis as the backplane, using the same channel prefix, which means all of these things share the same signal R connections. So as long as you send the response to the right connection, in this case, you're using the groups and the username that comes in the message, the response will be received back to the same front end application. As you saw over here, when we actually made this request, this is all working with AWS Lambda. Quickly recap, if you are running SignalR on Lambda, one of the key things you need to do is to actually create an instance of your web application, which means you will need to use ASP.NET within Lambda. You create your web application builder, you map everything up, you remember to map your hubs, albeit the endpoint you map them to is largely irrelevant because as far as Lambda's concerned, there's no endpoint to connect. And then you can use dependency injection and work with that as you normally would. As long as you're sharing the same backplane, this will work. Now, you might think this is going to affect cold starts, and it will, of course, affect the cold starts of your Lambda function because you're starting up ASP.NET, you're connecting to the Redis backplane. But remember, these are asynchronous applications, and asynchronous backends typically don't have the same latency requirements that a front end would. So, so although, yes, this will lead to longer cold starts in your Lambda function, it may not be an actual problem. And of course, when you think of the trade-offs, the reduction in operational overhead, lower costs, making your code simpler, this is a huge win. So that's it, it's as simple as that to use SignalR with your Lambda functions. Remember to create the ASP.NET application, connect to the same backplane using something like Redis, and you will be off and running. So when your boss comes over and asks you whether you can connect SignalR to Lambda, you can say a resounding yes. I'll see you all in the next video.